Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Buster Show podcast. Today, I am thrilled because my guest is Princess Sarah. Yep, you heard that right. Welcome to the show, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. This We have so much to talk about. Um, you know, all, all of the great work that you're doing, your story. Um, to start this off, though, for anybody who hasn't had the pleasure yet of getting to know you or, or meet you, how obviously this story has been trending around the world. We've known each other long before that, but uh, the story that really has everybody captivated right now, I, I couldn't do it justice um, in terms of how you found out that you were a princess. Uh, I would love if you could just give a, a quick bio uh, and explain sort of how, how that happened, I guess put reason, rhyme and reason to why everybody in the world loves that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, thanks. Um, so I was adopted into this amazing, loving white family in West Virginia and um, grew up, went to college and graduate school. And then when I moved to LA, I wanted to know um, more about my birth family. And I wanted to know where I came from. I wanted to know biological, like, medical history or and who I look like I just had all these questions I wanted to get answered and I didn't know where to begin and I did this class called landmark worldwide and I said I want to have a breakthrough in my acting career because I was doing tv and film at the time but when I went to the course something much deeper showed up I realized it was time for me to find my birth family and my friend was in the class art and, he, and they said tell the person sitting next to you where you're holding back in your life. And I said to my friend, Art, I'm terrified to find my birth father. And he said, why? I said, I've heard it costs thousands of dollars for a private investigator and I don't know where to begin. And I'm really afraid of being rejected. And he said, listen, I know a private investigator who won't charge you more than a hundred bucks and your father is gonna love you. And I said, okay, call the private investigator, three hours, all the information I needed for 25 bucks, not thousands. Um, for, and then I actually wrote a letter to Maryland, which is like pre Facebook and everything, because they said, you know, you don't want to pick up the phone and make a phone call. Cause sometimes that freaks people out and they hang up. So write a letter, let them read it, let them take their time. So I wrote a letter four days later, I get a phone call and there's this woman on the other line. She says, hello, Sarah, this is Evelyn. How are you? And I thought, what? <laughs> Oh my God. I was like, is this a Jamaican woman I met the other day? She said, I'm your auntie. We received your letter. And I started to bawl. I said, thank oh you so much for calling. God. I didn't know if I'd ever hear from you, see you. She said, Sarah, I was there when you were born. I used to take care of you when your mother would go to the grocery store. Hold on, hold on. Let me get your uncle on the phone. And then my uncle gets on the phone. He's like, oh, Sarah, we are so happy you've been found. Do you know who you are? And I'm like, I'm Sarah. He says, you are part of a royal family. Your great-grandfather was a paramount chief. Your grandfather, you can be chief someday. You are a princess in this country. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> this is a lot of information. Okay. They said, we're going to contact your father in Sierra Leone. He's going to be so happy to meet you. So they contact my father. And during those uh, two weeks while they get a message from village to village, because this is 2004 and a lot of people didn't have cell phones, right? So... I start getting phone calls from all these different African family members who live in the United States. Hello, Sarah, I'm your Uncle Ali, your father's favorite uncle. Hello, Sarah, I'm your Auntie Jenny. They used to call your father and me twins when we were little. Hello, Sarah, hello, Sarah. So all of these African family members are calling me, welcoming me when I thought they're not gonna wanna meet me, they're not gonna wanna talk to me, but it was literally this homecoming. And then I go, I, then my father calls after two weeks, I hear his voice. And the first thing he says to me is he says, please forgive me. I didn't know how to find you after you'd been placed in adoption. Your name had changed. Everything had changed. And I said, no, 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 no. Please forgive me because I've been making you wrong my entire life just to protect myself. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And he said, okay. So we planned a trip um, for six months later, went and met all those African family members, you know, the hello set of ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went to Sierra Leone and I was welcomed. My father gave me this beautiful green African dress. And when I arrived in the village, there were hundreds upon hundreds of people to welcome me singing. And all the women came forward wearing the same green dress singing, we're preparing for Sarah. So that, that was my little journey to <laughs> West it, Africa. It's fantasy. Like that's really... I mean, we'll talk about it later, but that's literally a Disney super movie right there. <laughs> um, 
but it's it's crazy because i mean just the the mutual respect like you couldn't write up a better way for like your father to open up that conversation because that's such a difficult thing not how old were you at the time i was let's see i was 28 when i went to sierra you're, a, yeah. you're an adult yeah i was <laughs> an, adult. an adult right so that's such a and you only get one shot at that because first impressions are everything they really yeah. are they really are i was so nervous i was so terrified and nervous but when i met my father i could see how nervous he was his his eyes were saying like, please like me, please accept me. And he's this statuesque man in this country who does work with so, I mean, our family runs a chiefdom of 44,000, um, actually more than that now. And, and so he has such a huge role in the country, but when we saw each other, we were both just so nervous. Like we became like little kids. It was really fun. It was really awesome. <laughs> That's crazy. But you know, I, I would make the argument that they were luckier to find you than the other way around because of the work and how involved you've gotten in Sierra Leone since. Because you, like, obviously you had no relation to Sierra Leone beforehand. It was just, I mean, had you heard of Sierra? I mean, obviously. I, well, I did know that my birth father was from Sierra Leone. So oh, I did yeah. know that connection, but I didn't know all the other history and information about my family. So, yeah. So after yeah. you go to Sierra Leone for the first time, how long were you there for like this grand celebration? <laughs> you know, I was there for about, um, let's see, two two weeks. I was there for two weeks, the first trip. And then do you remember, um, like, was there a moment where things clicked where you wanted to like, help people there? Um, or you yeah. saw things that you could be of help with? Where did, where did that, did that kick in and there's those first sort of two weeks there? Yeah, what, I, what happened is I saw what happened after an 11 year blood diamond war from 1991 to 2002. So I was there in 2004. So I was seeing the remnants of this war. I saw that um, the school, Bube High School that my grandfather helped build, I saw that it had been set on fire and it was kind of in ruins, certain parts of it. Um, I saw people with missing arms and missing legs that were amputated during the war. And I said to myself, I can't act like I didn't see this, but one of the things you had mentioned is maybe I was able to give them more, but really what they've given me has been beyond incredible because my awareness of the world um, has expanded from going to meet my birth family. My awareness of the simplicity and beauty of not having all these tangible things like computers and this and that. When you have this kind of level of peace, there's such beauty and I've actually taken high school students to Sierra Leone to do projects. And they, one of the students said, I feel safer in this village than I ever have in Los Angeles. And she grew up in a really safe area in a beautiful area in LA. So I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, you can just, children just run around and everybody's, everyone's chill, child. So everyone takes care of each other. And she just like, kids can't just run around by themselves outside. And I was like, yeah, that's true. So she had me also see the beauty of the country, even though it had been gone through war. Um, so there's such a beautiful give and take that has been a wonderful learning experience for me. And we've been, we started a nonprofit called Sierra Leone Rising, doing work in public health, education and female empowerment and doing projects. And we actually, speaking of Hoops Nation, we actually set up a basketball hoop in the village and people were playing basketball and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. They were like, whoa, this is great. So it was really a lot of fun. So, uh, I mean, we've done a lot of other projects as well, of course. No, that's, that's incredible. And that community aspect is, I mean, it really hasn't existed in America in 200 years. Like, <laughs> I mean, people here, like I've, I've never even experienced that sort of thing ever. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's, that's a really interesting point that that uh, uh, young lady made from LA, that she felt safer there. 
when most people, when they think about some of those countries, they just immediately, the first thoughts are like, you know, disease or whatever, like, or like war all the time, because war. that's all what we see on the news. But there's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's a community. It's right on the ocean. So the beaches are gorgeous. I mean, there's, there are these hidden gems all over the continent. And so many countries are just so magical, but people, I feel like we don't always know because we often hear, hear what doesn't work rather than hearing all the beautiful things that are working. You hear the worst of the worst and very rarely the best of the best and nothing in between. And particularly in a place where not everybody has an iPhone 12, how are you even supposed to see the normal? And she actually spoke about this, the same student, Catherine, she said, she came back and gave a presentation with some of the students and she said, we break our iPhones at parties to get the new iPhone this, to get the new iPhone that. She admitted this, I, I was shocked. And she said, and there are kids who get an empty water bottle and go to the pump and they can use it as a toy, they play soccer with it, or they go to the pump and fill it up with water. She said, we have, and they're so happy. She said, we have all these things and it's never enough. She said, they, ha they don't have all of these, things, these tangible things, but they're so happy. She said, what's going on with us? So that was really powerful coming from a 17 year old student. It was really interesting. So what did all of that teach you about sort of perspective and how to have that back here in the United States? Because that's something that I lack. That's something that many people lack because it's hard to think about it, but how do you sort of keep that as an integral part of you? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that I think about it in so many different ways. I think even in my day-to-day -day life when I'm challenged with something and I think about, Sarah, you have all of this that you need to make this happen. You know, there was a time when because of the need for ink, they were traveling to Bo 16 miles to get papers printed. Like things that I can reach down out of my printer and grab things, like just the simple things or even having like running water in the house. Now, granted in the provinces where my family lives, there's less access to running water. Most people have wells, which is a huge project we're working on, clean drinking water and having wells that are dug, which are about $11,000 to dig deep enough to get clean water so it won't go dry or become contaminated, but it'll stay there for years and serve thousands upon thousands of people. So it makes a big impact. But we just go to our faucets, right? And get clean drinking water, or we just turn on and have a hot shower. Like we don't think twice about it. Um, and I think it's had me really be humbled, um, see my own privilege, and also, also learn from them about sometimes all the privileges aren't always as great as they may seem. Not that they're bad, but also how much I can learn from a community that doesn't have all these things as distractions, but actually just connecting with each other in such a beautiful way, which I feel like is so important, so important and so beautiful. Yeah, so. no, a hundred percent. Yeah, it's like the only things that are really relevant are the things that help you keep going, right? So like the yeah. basics and then, I mean, you can, obviously the argument exists as to where once you have the basics like food, water, a place to sleep, uh, health, um, that's it. Yeah. Your, those happiness, are like what your, your happiness doesn't increase disproportionately uh, in perpetuity in relation to anything in excess of that. It will just be a dopamine hit, which... <laughs> Which, like anything, it levels well out. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. You get, a, you get a really nice bag, you know, <laughs> or like for people listening to this, a really nice sports card, whatever it may be. Like you get that hit. Like when I buy a, a, into sports cards, if I buy a sports card, I get a dopamine hit and then it levels out. So then what's next? Right? You, you need to fulfill that or, or you go down like a stock. But, you know... <laughs> In terms of like the basics, the only things that actually play a longer benefit are if you continuously eat healthy. That's, the, that's one of the few things that actually is a necessity that will compound and make you feel better and benefit you over time. So it's like, how do you 
I mean, the thing is, like, how, how do we help everybody get those basics and realize that everything else is just a dopamine hit, right? Yeah, yeah. And how can we all learn from each other and, and also see different communities as like teachers as well, even if they don't have all the means. Like Sierra Leone has been one of the, and the people have been the best teachers, some of the best teachers of my life about life and about what's important and what's not. Like it, it, it's, it's been a gift to find my family in a number of ways. Um, to learn about life and what's important to me and what's not. It's definitely changed as a result <laughs> of going to Sierra Leone. Do you think the world would be a much better place if everybody visited places like that? Like, oh, so yeah. 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 Like, and I think there's a level of peace and beauty that comes from that for people. I was blown away by the impact it had on these. I took eight students from the Oakwood School there, and I was really shocked Oakwood School here in Los Angeles, and I was really shocked at their feedback. Not that they're not brilliant, amazing students, but things that I didn't see, they were teaching me as well. They were learning how to count in Mende. They probably speak better Mende, which is my family's language than I do. But Catherine actually wrote an essay to get into college about a, a most influential person in her life. And she wrote about this little girl she met in Sierra Leone who was nine years old and the impact that girl made on her life. Then Catherine gets into Stanford, goes to Stanford, um, starts working with a Peace Corps worker to get a computer center in the north part of Sierra Leone. They get the computer center in the north part of Sierra Leone, and the Peace Corps worker is talking to President Obama when he was in the White House about our computer center in Sierra Leone. And that's because this young girl who was 17 had all these insights and was like, let's, let's make these connections. Love. So it's pretty profound, you know? Yeah. And then the impact of a computer center in a place that doesn't have access to computers. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Like, at least in the provinces, the city does, but the provinces, the outer area, like the rural areas, it's very different. So yeah, it's a makes a big difference. Yeah. And it's, it, it kind of goes in line with that classic saying of like, you know, you can learn something from anybody and the only time that you can't is when you think that you can't. Um, and that's applicable to a young girl who, you know, may or may not even speak the same language as you. Um, but you can literally learn something from everybody. It doesn't matter if you are President Obama or anybody else, you know? So I love that that, that, that happened. That's awesome. So what are the biggest things going forwards in, in terms of helping Sierra Leone? What, what are the priorities? Um, and I, I guess where, where else can people find more out about your, um, your foundation and, and so on? Yeah, it's sierraleonerising.org. Um, that's where you can find information about our nonprofit. And we're really focusing on wells, as I mentioned, for clean drinking water. Um, because that, you know, honestly, if you have clean drinking water that shifts your health, which we do public health, education and female empowerment. So that really makes a big difference in people's health and their well-being. Like we gotta have water. Like we can even be without food for a certain amount of time, but you gotta have clean drinking water. So that's what we're really working on. We've dug wells, um, about nine that are serving uh, many thousands of people with clean drinking water. And we've gotten a promise of about one, two, three, four, four or five wells coming in this new year, 2021, um, of people who are donating. So that would be incredible to get more donations for wells. Um, we're also working on a prosthetic center because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people lost their arms and legs during the war. Um, and we don't have a lot of physical therapy support for people, even if you have a stroke or you need physical therapy. Right. So we're sending people to Ghana to get trained um, students and um, to then come back and we're building a prosthetic center. So we're also fundraising for that. And also um, for the, a little girl named Jilla, we actually did um, a fundraiser for her already. She's six years old. She got an infection, had her leg amputated and we're sending she and her mom to Ghana probably in the next month or so to get a prosthetic leg so she can walk and wow. do physical therapy to, to adjust her hip. So um, we're really excited that Sandy Burkhart, who's a Rotarian, has 
spearheaded that with my brother Hindo Bay Pessoa on the ground who runs our nonprofit over there. So we've all been, this is, this is, none of this is me. I mean, this is, I'm part of it, but this is a big working wheel with so many different people to make all this happen. It takes a village, really, it does. A hundred percent. But the big thing is just that these people get help. I mean, yeah, it's important. And, and there's, they're like, this is my family. This is a, it's not a movie like the Blood Diamond movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jimon Hunsu that I can press pause and go do my thing. It's like, there's no pause. This is my family. This is a community that I love. And, and if somebody in, you know, a community needs help with clean drinking water, we know that from Flint, Michigan, it's like, what can we do to support? So, yeah. yeah, and it's like, you know, places like Flint took forever. You can only imagine what it's, you know, the time frame. And they're, still, they're still working on clean drinking water. It's not even completely handled. So that's something that's... Right. You know, so the, the point of that proves yeah. just like how crazy the timetables can, you know, the time frames can be in terms of getting these people help. And yeah. it's it's tricky when you can't just drive somewhere where it's different you know like that is the whatever the state of the the matter is the state of the matter is there so that's why it's it's particularly important that everybody supports um so i want to i want to jump into this uh this disney news oh uh, yes yeah i i want to just open it up i this is a total coincidence but i'm wearing a mickey mouse shirt so oh my gosh you are that's so <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. Big Mickey Mouse fan. Um, big supporter. Uh, but I, I wanted to to open the floor up to you to, to give a little bit more context so uh, I can I can accurately understand the situation. <laughs> yeah. So um I co-wrote a book with my writing partner Tracy Trivis um called A Princess Found. And it came out many years ago. And it's a memoir about finding my birth family in Sierra Leone. And um, just before COVID hit, after months and months of negotiations, we finally signed on the dotted line with Disney. And um, Disney Plus is turning it into a movie, oh um, live action. And I'm live so excited. Live action? Live action. Yes. Yes. Live action. Um, and it, I'm really thrilled about it. We're, we're so excited. And, you know, it's, it's a process. It takes a while to make a movie, but it is happening and it's in development, which is great. That's insane. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We're really excited. We're really excited. Um, and then there's also something else that we're working on separate, completely separate, which is not about my life. But um, we're working on an animation um, with Confidential Creative and Randy Jackson um, and George, uh, my boyfriend. We're all working on, as you know him very well, <laughs> um, we're working on an animation um, that actually teaches young people about culture through an uh, animated character who goes around the world and does all these amazing things. And it's actually in a wonderful way to learn about cultures in different parts of the world and so on. So that's actually moving forward as well, which is really exciting. But it's not about my story, but it's just kind of a, a separate entity that we're working on. That's amazing. If you had to, uh, if you had to pick an actress um, who were to uh, play and depict your life, what, uh, what, you know, what would you be thinking? that's that's a hard one we've thought about different people and i and i and we're not sure because things change all the time like some actresses are available and then they're working on a big film and they're not available right you know and and i'm hesitant to put it out there because then they'll be like i'm gonna do it you know and, and i don't know it's it's also you know i'm a consultant on the whole thing but we've also got to see what disney thinks and so on um, i'm i'm actually um one of the producers on on the film so i'm excited executive producing so i'm excited about that so i get to help help in that realm <laughs> and then well yeah i mean there there are so many things so many exciting like level like you get have people playing you at different ages like that sort of oh my god it's kind of crazy i don't think it's really hit me yet like i know it's happening but i think it's kind of like i don't know i think it's kind of surreal still a little bit <laughs> 
<laughs> that this is all happening, which is exciting. Yeah, that's that's fun. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also curious for like the obviously Disney launched Disney Plus and that's been hugely successful. Um, I feel like we're in a new world of of film and movies and it's all online. I, I'm curious. I've had this conversation a few times with people, but whether movie theaters are are a thing of the past. I know it's so sad. But... I love movie theaters. I love, I love, it's one of my favorite things to do is go to the movies and have popcorn and M&Ms. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the best. And I don't know, I, I hope they don't go away, but I do have to say so much is online. It's a different world we're moving into. So we'll see, we'll see. And the viewership is so much better online. You know what a great business would be? Somebody who brought like movie theater popcorn, like an Uber Eats, but just for movie theater snacks and popcorn. And they were quick. And it came in like, a, like I don't know how it should arrive, but somebody, that's a great business opportunity given theaters being closed. Yeah, it is. And I heard that in some places you can like rent a theater for like a hundred bucks and you and your friends could go and everyone has to spread out in the theater. I don't know if that's still happening, but I've heard that some theaters are doing that. And then of course we've got the drive-ins, like we're actually going way back into time. Yeah. Like people are doing drive-ins out here in LA. So that's kind of interesting. Drive-in, you're like obstructed view. <laughs> I know, I know. But if, if the screen's big enough and up high enough, it can work, you know? So. Movie theater popcorn's undefeated though. It's the best. It's the best. So, Not necessarily for you, but it tastes work great. <laughs> and that's what matters. In a while, only when great movies come out. <laughs> right. Uh, so this this story, your story, uh, you know, obviously this happened a few years ago, but just now it is taking over the headlines. I saw the ABC at the, the, the here and there. What's that experience been like sort of seeing your story shared in so many places? Is it like a little spooky or exciting or how do you feel about you and your story now being in, in so many homes? You know what? I'm really excited and, and, I, and I'm honored that it's been out there. I know that there were a, over a billion views with the um, NBC Black interview that I did and then it all these other outlet media outlets picked it up and it just kind of was one of the number one stories in the world that week and it just kind of took off uh, um, on the front page of Apple and all these other things um, but what I realized I had to tell you this Buster it's like for me and this is the the truth for me like this is I'm getting this opportunity but it's not really for me I mean, if you, if you will, to me, it's like, I get to be out there and be what I wish I would have had as a little girl, like seeing other black and brown women or women of color, um, being a princess, um, or doing these things in the world because I needed those examples as a kid. And I feel like I was, it was hard to always find them. And now I feel like we do have more examples with all these incredible people of color who are doing amazing things. But to me, this opportunity is so much bigger than me. It's like, I'm a vessel here for something so much bigger for little black and brown girls to go, oh wait, it's not just a Disney movie. It's actually, this person actually exists. She's real, this is true. This is about Sierra Leone, a, a small country that most people probably have never even heard of and bring awareness to a culture, to a community and a, and a real life story. And, and to have, little young ones, because I'm all about empowering kids and specifically girls to, to see what's possible and who they are. Because in our country, our history and our history books only talk about slavery. And if we actually go back, we actually are going to, we do come from kings and queens and architects and doctors, and then we're brought to America and made slaves. So our history isn't just the slavery that we hear in America, it goes, it, it, it goes way back. And I think that that's important for young people and, and all of us to know, to actually have that part of our history, even though it's been separated from us for so long. But to me, I'm, I'm really excited about that opportunity 
and, and Stephanie Elaine, um, who I'm working with, the producer who is the first African-American woman to produce the Academy Awards. She's amazing. She did so, she's done so many things and so many TV shows and movies. She actually wrote me and said, we need to have, you know, people of color see our history back before slavery. And this story, it really can tell that. And that's why it's another reason it's so important. So I'm so excited and honored to be able to share this small piece of, of this bigger picture. That's amazing. And it's <laughs> true. It's a really interesting point you bring up in terms of the history. Because history is like, obviously, not just what happened, but the way that it was depicted. History was written by the same people who did the terrible things. And then it was never changed by anybody who came after that for, I, I mean, because they were messed up too, right? So it's about- no one, wants, no one wants to make themselves look bad, right? So how are we learning the history and what is, whose perspective and whose view is it? Is it from someone who's a Native American? What would that history be like? Or someone who is an African who was, you know, a slave, what is their perspective? But we don't always, we don't hear that always, unless we go to study African-American studies in college, often, unless you have a very advanced school or something. No, it's, it's so true. So it's rewriting that history in the true, true, honest, um, and in a way that will uplift, you know, young, young guys and girls. I, I love that. I think it's, it's so important to for everybody, not not just to have role models and like mentors, whether you know them personally or you're just seeing them on the screen, but uh, like you said, to have that form of representation in, in everything that you're passionate about. And particularly when you're young, which are the most important years, that's when you're going to be interested in, you know, princesses and kings and princes and king, like all, all of that world. I know like I was, you know, in, everybody's into that kind of stuff, particularly when they're, when they're super young. So having that for everybody in those important developing years, I think that's, that's the best part about it all. Which is exactly why this animation is also really important that we're working on, because having to touch on cultures from around the world at such a young age is really important to me as well. I love so. that. I, I have a question for you. If you could go back and tell yourself one piece of advice to before you found out that you were a princess, what would you go back and tell yourself with no knowledge of what happened in between? What would I advice would I give myself? Um, I think I would have given myself the advice to not be afraid and to jump in sooner. I think things happen when they're meant to be, however, um, and, and in due timing, but I think there's something so powerful inside of taking a leap and, and to not sound cliche, but really like I stepped into a, I was terrified to find my birth father and I was willing to, because the stories I'd made up in my head, well, he might reject me, he did it out, like all this stuff, it took me a long time before I met him. But what I would tell myself is don't believe the stories in your head, the fear, just try it because you never know. And I'm grateful that I did finally at 28, but I would just tell my younger self like to jump in sooner and to not be afraid and that you can handle the outcome. Like you, you've got this. That's what I would tell myself. That's amazing. I love that. Well, <laughs> Princess Sarah, you, you are the best. Um, it has been a pleasure, you know, just getting to know you over these, these, it's crazy that it's been like two or three years now. How insane right. is that? Time flies. Um, sure where, where can people find you best? Um, probably my Instagram. I am princess. So I am princess SC for Sarah Culberson. Check me out. I'd love to connect. We're sharing all the upcoming things that are happening. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for, for some of the some of my audience if they haven't yet to, to hear it. So, without any further ado, thank you so much again. This has been an absolute yeah. pleasure.
pledge. I appreciate you coming on and uh, definitely do this again sometime. You're amazing. And thank you for all the things you're doing. Thank you for your time. And thank you for you. <laughs> all right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Peace.